Executive Secretary. We are going to begin this uh, uh, launch. Recording in progress. Flagship. Estamos listos cuando quieras. Yes, we're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Barcena. We would like to say first good morning, good afternoon uh, throughout all of our continent to everyone from the venue of the Latin American Economic Commission in Santiago, ECLAC. We will begin with the press conference, the launch of the annual report of ECLAC, Foreign Direct Investment in Latin America and the Caribbean 2021. This is being held virtually from Santiago and it is being <clears throat> Street. We have uh, different platforms, Zoom, uh, connecting all of our region in this moment. Uh, and cepal.org also is the website of cepal, w, at luck, dot org, Facebook and Twitter. We greet everyone, especially the journalists that have registered in order to participate, as well as the members of ECLAC within the, uh, this uh, session. The presentation of the document, of course, is going to be presented by Alicia Barcena, providing the main conclusions of the report. After the presentation of the executive secretary, we will go on to a Q&A session by the journalist, and we remind all the members of media, please send in by inviting your questions either to the chat of this Zoom platform or to the email conferenciaprensa at cepal.org, conferenciaprensa at cepal.org. Without further ado, now the floor is yours, Mrs. Alicia Barcena, Executive Secretary of the Latin American and Caribbean Economic Commission. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And I'm sorry for the delay we've had. And here we are again connected. And first and foremost, I would like to tell you that this flagship, this document, in fact, is a document with plenty of information. It's going to be very difficult to convey to you all the main messages that we are trying to convey on this occasion. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank the team that collaborated in drafting this document, something very important we do every single year. We greet Mario Timoli, he's with me, he's Assistant Executive Secretary, he has coordinated this, as well as other substantive documents, Joanny Stumpo, who was the main coordinator of this document, Álvaro Calderón, Cecilia Plotior, Matilde, Valeria Jordán, and Leonardo Cabello. Hopefully, I left no one behind. Yes, indeed. Amidst the crisis, we analyze the uh, uh, foreign direct investment uh, trend in the world and mainly in the region. This is what I would like to present to you. Please, I will tell you what this is all about. We are doing an analysis in the context of the largest health crisis of the region and the world. And uh, this report of foreign direct investment has four topics that are very important. 
First, we analyze what is happening in terms of foreign direct investment at world level. And we analyze that we are experiencing a difficult time worldwide because we're seeing the lowest level of uh, FDI in recent decades. And we see that world FDI has moved back to the lowest value since 2005, and 66% of this FDI was destined uh, the, to the developing economies. In terms of values, the FDI uh, gives priority to developed economies, and this we're going to study further, but 66% was sent to developing economies. In uh, many regional differences, China grew. China is on the one hand as a receiver and also one of the most relevant investors. We will be seeing why. But Latin America and the Caribbean has seen a minus 34.7% drop. We will see this further. And as I was saying, the value of the projects uh, is going towards the developed economies. We've also analyzed mergers and acquisitions as usual, and we see that the drop has been smaller. Obviously, China, the EU, Latin America are the three topics that we analyze in further depth. And second, the report analyzes what is happening or what is the outlook towards 2021. And of course, there we see that the scenario is complex for this region. The behavior of transnational corporations is very interesting, and we analyze this here in the report, because com corporations have greater liquidity than ever before. However, their search for investment or their investment commitment is more directed towards the resilience of their value chains, restructuring their a pro corporate approaches and also there is a very relevant connection between this investment and recovery plans and the ability of countries to control the pandemic we're considering together with umtai by the way that world fdi will grow between 10 and 15 percent and in latin america and the caribbean we move between minus five and plus five that is, as always, a range for 2021. Now, this document has two aspects that we analyze in greater depth, and that is the behavior uh, Chinese FDI, not only Latin America and the Caribbean, which is our focus as usual, but also we analyze what is it what is uh, the strategy that China has had to use FDI in their own development strategy? And this is very relevant because China has seen very clearly how FDI can be a major instrument for their development strategy in the long term. And of course, that we are seeing this tension between the US and China especially in terms of leadership in technology and digital technology. And in Latin America and the Caribbean, of course, China is in a way going through an interesting transition, which we will analyze between, I would say, the traditional interest in natural resources, yes, but with a greater focus on electricity, power, and transport. And we believe that Latin America and the Caribbean must address the issue of FDI with a multilateral approach, quite beyond the bilateral approach that we've had so far. And the fourth uh, block is on investing in the digital age. This is very relevant. The, what the report does is an analyze how this is evolving, the digital industry. And we see how the traditional sector uh, has grown a more and uh, also what is going on worldwide, and that's in this chapter. And we see that telecommunications are losing relevance, or although, of course, they are a key factor, because they are a key factor to deploy the infrastructure, of course. And we see how in our region in particular, Traditional corporations are getting digitalized and there is an increasing datafication, that is the use of data has become the major center 
or focus of uh, leadership in these platforms, which poses major challenges in terms of governance, regulation, and privacy, as we have seen. So let's begin an by analyzing what is happening with foreign direct investment flows at world level. Here we see, as usual, we're sawing the history since uh, 1990, but above all, we see that FDI uh, fell to the level it had 15 years before. That is, please take a look that it, from 2019 and 2020, it fell by minus 35%. This is a major drop and uh, FDI inflows shrank to the lowest level that we've been able to see since 1998, even in the developed economies and quite sensibly in the transition economies. And we are, we are seeing the uh, world flow, but also of the developed economies in terms of flows, not as a value. And that is why we will be talking about this difference as a flow. If the eyes moved far more towards developing or de developing economies, uh, the developed economies, although the flow is less and it does drop, the overall value is higher. And that is what we too analyze. And also we see that there is a significantly less uh, uh, fall in Asia, which we should point out, but in Africa, Latin America, Unfortunately, the drop has been much sharper. In Africa, minus 16, and Latin America, much higher. Of course, China does not drop, Hong Kong either, India either, and these are the developing economies that drive precisely that 66% of world flows do go to developing economies. And so, but we're going to analyze the value also because that is very relevant. We are also going to see that the drop and sectoral reconfiguration of announced projects also reflects a very relevant trend. Above all, in, in all cases, the value of investment projects uh, decreased by minus 33%. And the uh, sectors most affected are mining, oil, and the automotive industry, on account of several reasons. And of course, the other sector that has also seen a drop, but less, is uh, services. However, but let's see. In, so within services, we must make a difference because there are services, hotels, servicing, and restaurants that have undergone major drops of uh, 55%, but there are IT services, and this is a relevant part of the report, where IT services, on the contrary, rose by 22%. Now, we see also when we're, when we take a look at how the issue of mergers and acquisitions, how this has happened, because a lot of the process in the last year, 2019, 2020, was in fact with regard to mergers and acquisitions, which is what has fallen least of all. Mergers and acquisitions fell minus 6%. And this shows something that is very relevant, and that is that transnational corporations have a trend towards strategic purchases and corporate restructuring, which is what we need to highlight. And for example, we see that in the developed economies here, once again, we see, for example, in the EU, mergers and acquisitions. Please take a look at how they grow the green bar from 2019 to 2020. And there, there is a, an, an impact that affected this. And that is, for example, the acquisition by Unilever in the UK and Unilever, this was a, um, an acquisition, Great Britain and the Netherlands. And this is an example of corporate restructuring in Europe, and which means that the this dimension of mergers and acquisition actually grows. But in the US, it was different. And there, what happened was that, that there was an agreement between uh, Pfizer, US company, with the German company, BioNTech. And 
once again, Europe grew more than the US in this uh, merger and acquisition. And a developing Asia also has very interesting mergers and acquisition on account of the role above all of China and Hong Kong. And there, of course, we have this dynamic at world level. So what happened in Latin America and the Caribbean? Of course, the report contains a fairly detailed analysis of what has happened at world level, but I wanted to focus on this, how this pandemic, so to speak, uh, has affected investment inflows, FDI inflows. They were the lowest since 2010. So we're talking of a major drop, a trend that had already had been on the downturns earlier on. And in the, in the plot, we see that in 2012, it peaked, but then it slowly dropped off since 2013. And today, from 2019 to 2020, the drop was of minus 34.7%. So in 2020, um, 105 a billion dollars uh, inflows to the area and the lowest value in the lowest decade also in terms of GDP because GDP, the weight of FDI on GDP is 2.5 in 2020. Please look, it was almost 3.5 in previous years. And so the drop is really very relevant in the decade of 2010. It was at 3.5% of GDP. And so who are, as always, the big winners and the losers in terms of FDI? Well, we've analyzed 30 countries of which five were able to increase their FDI, whereas another 25 countries did not see this rise on the country, a drop in FDI. Now, who were the five that were received more FDI inflows during the pandemic? Well, of course, Bahamas, Barbados in the Caribbean, Ecuador and Paraguay in South America and Mexico. Now, Mexico became the second receiver of FDI after Brazil. Brazil is always number one, but in this case, Brazil the truth is that it suffered a major drop of minus 35.4, which is a, a major uh, thing at regional level. And Mexico, on the other hand, increased by 6.6%. And so really, these two destinations, Brazil and Mexico, are closer in terms to the historical values. And so Brazil really does have 42% of the uh, FDI inflows and Mexico 30%. Now, on what regions lost out or where FDI inflows uh, dropped most? Well, undoubtedly Central America with minus 89.4%, the most remarkable case in Central America, Panama with negative inflows and in the Caribbean of minus 25.5%, mostly because of the tourist area fell very strongly and one of and and the Dominican Republic continued as a receiver a receiver and Guyana on account of various reasons that we can analyze later on and Guyana of course on account of the hydrocarbons to this i think it is important to add that mexico it reaches the highest percentage of FDI of uh, the region. What is the other major topic that we examine here? Is average profitability of FDI. The income of FDI is the quotient between the income and of FDI here in in purple or in dark red, burgundy color. Uh, in, yeah, yes, yes. Dark red bars and the yellow line shows the average income. So it was 4.2%. This is the lowest level since 2010. Compare with the 2010, it is the lowest level. And this means that there are less out capital outflows from our countries. This is 
repatriation of income is less. And therefore, how does this impact the countries? Well, in some way, in a positive way, because our deficits, look, the FDI income is marked in red bars. We see that in 2019, it was minus 1.9. In 2020, one, minus 1 1.6. If we analyze in the balance of payments, the current account in balance of payments, the relative weight of repatriation of FDI income or is uh, high. In 2010, it was minus 2.4. Today, it's minus 1.6. So historically, we are in a relatively low level, but it continues to be negative. That is, it costs us in terms of the current account of balance of payments. Well, the positive part of this balance uh, of current account is the uh, cash transfers or remittances. And it is clearly what uh, migrant families transfer to their families uh, in their countries of origin. And of course, the goods, the uh, trade balance, which is positive, maybe because of wrong reasons, as we have said in other documents, because it has been, I mean, the region is importing less, and therefore the balance, uh, the trade balance is positive. Uh, well, of course, we have other issues that do influence on the income of portfolio investments, services, uh, other topics that have an impact on the current account of balance of payments. What are the most struck sectors, most impacted sectors is, one of them is natural resources. They drop in minus 46%. Manufacturing, manufacturing, that is quite concerning for us in ECLAB. We're always worried about that because in fact, manufacturing are the ones that can bring a, a technology employment and that for us is always most valuable. But we need to say that the area where uh, FDI dropped less was in services in that area where we have in dark red color. And so here we can see that the service sector grows a bit more, manufacturing in relative terms, but all of them dropped, some more than others. But we need to see that in manufacturing, the most affected, most impacted countries are Brazil and Argentina, as you can see there in this report. Now, we also see that the drop of FTI in natural resources and manufacturing is precisely more evident is greater in Brazil and Mexico. And you can see that in the first two parts of the graph, you see that manufacturing in Brazil had a lower proportion in Mexico. Truth is that it was also, uh, it also dropped manufacturing sector. That is, there was an important a significant reduction in manufacturing sector, but also in natural resources. We can see that Brazil and Mexico have a reduction in, in natural resources, not in the Andean area. This is somewhat explained by the Ecuador uh, topic, and also in natural resources. It also drops, but not so much. And what has a better performance in all the economies is the service sector. And what I think it's important or what we want to highlight here is that the decline of investment of uh, natural resources was quite general all across the region. And those countries most impacted are Brazil and, Me and Colombia that received less in hydrocarbons. And in services, it's also observed the. Uh, in Colombia, the largest decline as a result of a tourism sector, hotels, and and in manufacturing, the uh, major trend is in Argentina and Brazil. 
that there, the drop that is. Why? In the case of Brazil, for example, the uh, Ford automotive uh, company that had installed in Brazil, established there 101 years back, closed down the uh, factory, the plant. And that is important because it generated uh, a loss of 5,000 jobs. And what is happening is that Ford is being restructured. But another automotive company like La Mier that produced the Mercedes-Benz in Brazil also closes down one factory and uh, you have 70 people left out of uh, jobs. Why? Because the demand for cars or for luxury cars has dropped down. And the demand in our region, I mean, so these automotive companies that were settled in Brazil, they close. And that also affects Argentina that is connected to this uh, supply chain. The drop of uh, cross-border mergers and acquisitions was important. It was 21, minus 21%. And it, so uh, that is a bit over than 2009 in terms of operations and amounts. You can see here a drop that really makes us go back to 2009 insofar as mergers and acquisitions. In what areas were they maintained or was there an increase or there was um, interest in power, infrastructure and transportation, electric power? And who mainly? China. China basically was the main player in our region in this type of mergers and acquisitions of uh, electricity service companies, as you see in Latin America, in South America, and then in construction, infrastructure, logistics, also has uh, uh, given rise to a lot of interest for transnational companies. Now, insofar as digital uh, terms, insofar as merger and acquisitions, it's not that high, but still, it is a very dynamic sector that offers very important alternatives. Alternatives. Now, the value of projects, that is a major issue because the value of those projects dropped to half, taking us back to levels of 2007, similar to 2007. The sectors that lost the most is metal mining, hotels, and tourism. Clearly, we see these are the sectors that lose the most. In fact, and mainly mining on the right side, you can see how mining projects have uh, received a strong impact in so far as the variation of announcements uh, to invest in our region. And of course, in amounts as well, and projects and sectors. Losing sectors, mining, ho tourism, hotels, transportation. Renewable energies will analyze that separately because that is a, quite an interesting phenomenon in our region. So why do we face all this? Because renewable energies is the sector that attracts the highest interest of foreign investors. When we speak about distribution by sectors of project announcements in 2020, 26% are in renewable energy. All of them dropped. Remember, but of the total that arrived to the region, and we, at the beginning, we said how much entered our region, which was 105 billion, Yes, 105 billion something. Uh, well, of that total, 26% was uh, in renewable energies, 10% telecommunications, carbon, oil, and gas also, but all of them in general dropped. However, the relative weight of renewable energies is one of the sectors that attracts the most foreign investors interest. And who come to invest in our region? How has this changed in time? Well, firstly, United States. The United States, which is the one we have in blue, it increases its share 
significantly. Europe, on the other hand, loses share. See, Europe used to be the main investor in the region. And really, there have been important changes where we've moved from 53% to 38% in Europe, whilst in US, we've gone from 23 to 37%. Analyzing 2010, 2014, then 2015, 2019, you can see this declining trend of Europe, but in 2020, we can clearly see how this proportion, this share dropped, where US grows 10 percentage points up to 37%. And this change of stru uh, in structure is observed because there is a lesser drop of US investments. All of them drop, but less. But the, those coming from the US have minus 5%, while those from Europe is minus 48%. And those of the Latin American companies towards Latin America also fall in minus 37%. There you can see, or 35%, an important drop. The investments of Europe abroad uh, declined sensitively throughout the whole world, not only towards Latin America, but from Europe to all of the world. And that, of course, is a behavior that we need to follow and observe of European transnational companies. This is an important trend to keep track of. Now, Latin American investments abroad, also, look how big the drop was from 45 5 billion to 12.3, so 73% drop in one single year. Very heterogeneous. Chile and Mexico show an increase of several companies, but also there are companies that, that close. Falabella closed in Argentina. Latam closed in Argentina. So there are Chilean companies that continue investing abroad, but also there are Chilean corporations that have sort of disarticulated or closed down companies in some countries. Mexico has uh, gone through something similar, truly. Uh, I would say that most of uh, FDI in the region traditionally uh, going abroad had come from Brazil, Colombia, and Panama. But now these countries, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Panama, register very important uh, drops or declines. In the Chilean case, still, there is an active internationalization of its companies seeking and looking for new fronts, new targets as a result of the crisis, uncertainty that is driving investors to look for positions outside of the country. Now, in the case of Mexico, the rationale is different. Mexico ratified the free trade agreement with the US, Canada, and Mexico. And this, of course, to some extent, has contributed to reverse an uncertainty that was in the negotiation of major corporations and economic growth groups. This is important. But there is a major disinvestment in Brazil, uh, same as in Colombia, in some. All FDI components suffered the impact of the pandemic. Affected by the closure of activities, it is very difficult for FDI to become a driver for recovery unless we do not do something quickly. Investments by transnationals have slowed and investors are, there's a deeper trend to move towards developed countries because developed countries have sent out clear signals of public investment that will be going to strategic sectors such as infrastructure, energy, uh, sustain environmental sustainability. All investors are looking at these signals and saying, well, it would be better to invest in developed countries that are looking towards the future. 
And mergers and acquisitions, as we said, came down by 21%, reached a, a, a real low with a major impact. So what we see with concern is that the interest in, by companies by setting up new capacities or, uh, or broadening what they're doing is restricted, as well as reinvestment in activities. And manufacturing uh, have had um, a, a, a sharper downturn. And this is of concern because that fall in manufacturing will have a major impact on value chains in our region because it's manufacturing that has always uh, includes uh, MSMEs rather than natural resources. So this document addresses investment in China in a changing world. And China, of course, has without a doubt become an economic power. And I think he, that here I would like to say that the influence or the presence of China goes far beyond FDI. And that is why we wanted to put to you the entire uh, panorama of the amounts in sovereign loans, construction contracts being carried out by China. China. And please look, loans, loans have increased by billions of dollars from uh, 10, 2010 to 2020, uh, uh, $1 trillion in construction contracts and mergers and acquisition, $81 billion. And with new announcements of projects, $60 billion. And so Chinese uh, companies or China is having a major impact on our region far more than before. And state-owned enterprises lead these investments. 82% are led by state-owned companies. And of course, the underlying tension in terms of leadership between the US and China trade disputes, technology disputes, and so on, are also having a major impact on how these uh, Chinese corporations in, behave in technology and communications far more present in Latin America than in North America and, and in Mexico and uh, Central America. But the interesting thing about China is that China has used these strategies for their own development plan in the medium term. And there are things that lead us to think that they've given priority to bilateral relations. And that is why we believe that it is so important to move ahead towards a greater multilateralism in terms of how we manage FDI. And we will address this later. 2020 was the year when China became one of the greater investors worldwide and the second receiver. And that is what is happening in relation to China. And China and Hong Kong, of course, both. From 1990 through 2020, please see the growth uh, seen the impressive growth by China. 1.3%, Lois, she corrects herself, from 13% to 31.8%. That is a, a very major growth uh, as a, a receptor of FDI. Unfortunately, we seem to have lost the audio. And I believe she continues that this should be highlighted. In the region, this trend has increased since 2010. FDI inflows increased. In 2010, $200 billion in inflows. But in 2010, 1.5. One, 1. And so we see that the accumulate total from 2010 to, through 2020, there were inflows, uh, FDI inflows of $15 billion uh, to the region. And this is very relevant in terms of Chinese participation in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. We've seen that this has grown from 1.7% in 2005 to 16.3% in from 2015 through 2019 to 22.9% in 2020, mergers and acquisitions. 
and the announcements similar, 3.5 to 4.7. But the most impressive are mergers and acquisitions, Chinese mergers and acquisitions in our region. So which are the most prevalent sectors in terms of mergers and acquisitions, mainly by China in the region? Without a doubt, there are many companies that are acquired by China that used to be owned by Canada or even the US. Please note, in, in very uh, varied topics such as electricity or power, gas, oil, these are perhaps very relevant sectors concentrated right there prior to 2015. But then after 2015, it continues in mining but far more directed towards uh, electricity, gas and water, which is also the focus in Chile, Brazil and Peru. And in terms of the other projects, as you see on the right in China, we see that announced uh, investment projects are more diversif diversified, mining, motor, transport, logistics. Here we see the relative weight of these announcements. Obviously, announcements in 2020 are less, but please take a look in 2015, 2019. Yes, they uh, reached a very significant sum in terms of uh, billions of dollars. And so what do we see in this sense? Well, without a doubt, I believe that what most important is, of course, in this, this chapter is a very, very rich, very original with a lot of information in terms of what is happening with China in our region of Latin America and the Caribbean and the world. But uh, since we do not have that much time, I would say there are four very uh, most important topics that we would like to point out here. First, we believe that it is indispensable to address a multilateral strategy to position interests in our region and that uh, FDI does contribute sh or should contribute to social development. This is very relevant because China has done more bilaterally in Europe, Canada and so on. But well, but for our region, it is very advisable that we should do it from the multilateral viewpoint. And we later on, we're going to see why. China proposed to be the leader in terms of world manufacturing powers and by 2049. And this was very, very clear in, during the anniversary of the Communist Party at their recent meeting. And this has been carried out because it went from being 5.5% to 11% of the world wealth in uh, FDI. And so they really doubled their wealth into their world wealth. And so they become the third region in terms of FDI worldwide, and especially in terms of manufacturing. We had seen that they were second in all topics, but in manufacturing, it is third. And in FDI, in fact, towards Latin America, China's had two phases. First, it focused in primary sectors, as we said, mining and hydrocarbons, and then second, in electricity, ports, and each time more in the digital area, carried out by state-owned companies. And of course, well, China continues to be one of the main destinations for our uh, exports. And Chinese uh, advance in uh, Eco green economy, electromobility, and renewables is clear, but not so much in our region. That is why we need to think, what sort of investment do we want by China to enhance the sectors that are of interest to us? And so we need to understand very well, what is China doing in a, a, along the way? This dispute between uh, China and the US for the technological leadership could really affect our region greatly, because we've seen some of these topics with Huawei and other cases. And once again, I believe that what has been called the digital Silk Road is a, a framework that would allow us to attract investment, yes, but also that we can uh, choose what sort of technology we would like uh, and that would be most important to us and in what areas could they be relevant uh, to our region. We must be have the clarity to know what sort of investment we really want. 
And that is why we've also analyzed investment during uh, the digital age. And we analyzed closely, and I invite you to see the document in detail. But what we do in this ver in, uh, version is to analyze how there's been an industrial restructuring of the world on account of digitalization, because there's been a very deep change in business models, consumption, production. And not only has digitalization transformed and reconfigured these industrial sectors, but we've gone from a hyper -commu uh, communicated society, because the truth is we were already fairly well connected towards a digitalized world, which is not the same thing. So one thing is con being connected to the internet and the other, another thing is digitalizing the sectors, economy, trade, consumption, everything. And so the digital economy, well, has consolidated new business models with digital platforms. It has acquired a major a role uh, worldwide. Please take a look at platforms for E-Trade. Look how they've grown. Here we, here we have the figures. There's been a tremendous movement here, very, very relevant worldwide and also in Latin America. And of course, also, uh, uh, platforms for internet and software services have increased very dynamically worldwide, without a doubt, but also Latin America and the software and IT services. And so there is a growth in hardware, uh, telecommunications less, and this is of concern because this is associated to the infrastructure. And of course, a major influence in traditional sectors. And so we're seeing how we have a digital economy based on the platform where the digital industry is growing more than the industrial, the traditional industrial sectors. The digital economy is going very, very fast. And we must also focus on investments associated to venture capital and mergers and acquisitions, which could help us. And well, the digitalization of traditional sectors is another area of uh, very great relevance because these sectors, in order to increase their productivity, they must innovate in terms of products and business models in order to compete with these uh, players in the digital economy. And so with the, they've resorted to strategic partnerships or mergers and so on and acquisitions. And of course, the connected economy and the digital structure. And this is a key support for digitalization. And that is why it is so relevant because it acquires an, an enabling nature, whether we do or not have the infrastructure to do this, and especially an expansion through uh, uh, investments in green fields uh, uh, with the deployment of new 5G tech infrastructure which is what today we need to address in our region. And so we see how the digital ecosystem, the, the industry has advanced hand in hand with global platforms. Yes, with a growth, as I was saying, that is much higher. We're at uh, 1,744 worldwide, 1,500% 1, in our uh, region. Uh, e uh, trade e commerce platforms. This is something that we need to address clearly what is going on in the world and how uh, internet service platforms, software, and so on. And we see how the region decouples whilst in e-commerce platforms, the region is in sync. When we go to software and internet services, the region sort of decouples and we stay behind, we lag behind. And this is most concerning because while the traditional sectors grew, at world level, they did in 76%. In our region, they contracted in 32%. So that is the trend. <laughs> and we cannot be left behind. And this is the core in this document. 
Now, we believe that digital economy is a great opportunity for the dissemination of innovation. First, because there's a boom of internet services. Look what has happened with Mercado Libre. It's the second most valuable company of the region, especially in South America, because in North America, it's Amazon stronger than Mercado Libre. But why is it so important, Mercado Libre? Well, we highlight this because Mercado Libre allows allows these small, medium, micro enterprises to be digitized and this to be digital and this boom of internet services as a result of the pandemic, of course, has allowed Mercado Libre to be the second company in the region and has gone uh, over uh, giants. For example, Mercado Libre is more valuable than Petrobras, just to have an idea. And therefore, we believe that there is a growth and the interest of investors has grown, especially to invest in this area, in this sector, and uh, innovative mechanisms have been created to have venture capital investing in these sectors. So let us leverage, let us make the most of this opportunity. I think capital can promote the development of digital startups. <clears throat> and one of the cases that we described in detail in this document is the case of Corner Shop, how it grew, how it became <clears throat> a very important digital company. And now it has merged with others like Uber. And uh, I think this is a topic to be addressed, analyzed, examined. There are many young people that are interested in this area and it's worth the while to see how some opportunities are taking place with FinTech, e-commerce, agriculture, in logistics. There are important opportunities there. How venture capital in the technology sector has increased and we can leverage some opportunities there. Mergers and acquisitions that drive digitization in traditional industry, traditional conventional industry, as I was saying in the world, digitization has grown in, in conventional industry and not in our region. It dropped in our region and that is so worry, worrisome. We should go in sync with the world. And so there has been an increase in conventional industries, but not with sufficient drive that is taking place at global level. Of course, there is a detailed analysis of all the operations, mergers and acquisitions that have taken place in the region, how much is being invested in FDI in some digital sectors in 2020. And you can see that we are saying that the digitization of industrial sectors is transforming the economy. For example, in the automotive sector, there's 25% of increase of labor productivity as a result of digitization. And there is a profound transformation in the supply chain with already more than 200,000 suppliers. Uh, such a deep change in such a relevant sector Mm, uh, as the automotive sector. In Mexico, in Brazil, same thing, 30% in an increase of efficiency of crops, 50% of reduction in environmental impact. So there are concrete gains in, of, out of the digitization of the industrial sector automotive se sector in Mexico, agriculture in Brazil, banking and financial sector in Colombia. But in the document, you will find an amount, enormous amount of examples, which are very key to highlight the importance that our traditional con conventional sectors to digitize. You have gains ahead, productivity gains. Of course, there will need to be labor training so as not to lose jobs. And that at the same time will benefit the small and medium companies. Infrastructure, it's essential here. Look at the gap, the gap between the world and Latin America as to the 
market share of fifth generation technology, that is 5G technologies. The world moves at 20% in 2015. Well, in our region, only 10% or 20%. And so we need to accelerate because the access to internet, the speed of access to internet is going to be very important. And that is very much related to companies according to their sizes. So we need to have connectivity infrastructure that is needs to be adequate, appropriate. And there are many gaps, Latin America, Caribbean and Europe. There's an enormous gap also in Europe you have the gap between Germany and Spain, for example. But in our region, we have significant gaps to be addressed. And we need to do that in order to support, especially countries that still go at very slow paces and uh, that are important, especially the urban rural gap. That is a major gap in our region. So digital development raises very many challenges. One of them is that of governance. How to govern the digital world, digital development. It is uh, cross-sectional. This sector is across the board. It needs to be part of a, the broadest development agenda. So it cannot be only a business dynamics. It has to be part of a strategy, national, regional, world strategy, where you have the participation of companies, public sector, um, uh, medium, small companies, uh, and therefore, the rules and regulations that uh, needs need to be or provide uh, uh, certainty and have regional regulatory frameworks to attract investment. And policies of conventional competition have been insufficient. And it is there that we need to have a clear strategy in order to prevent distortion in the valuation of the market of digital businesses that are mainly concentrated in data and in aggressive mergers and acquisitions. So we are clear that data are a very important assets, are very important assets. And this is uh, they are being valued data in a very rapid manner, but we need to include protection, security, data protection of all these assets. As a documentary said a while ago, a very good one that is called of uh, social media uh, in Netflix or networks, uh, where it says you do not access to a product, the pro you are the product. And that is the message. Our data are the product. And the markets and data cooperatives are being concentrated in few companies and not so much in terms of public good. Ideally, it would be to know what people are thinking in order to guide public policy. In this moment, our data, ourselves as a product, we as a product are serving enterprises, companies. And I think the reduction of gaps be among companies uh, needs to adapt to many things. And therefore, governance is key, state participation, market participation, society participation in more equitable manners is key. And especially tax treatment with multilateral arrangements that is already happening. And also uh, the taxes of digital companies, but not to the VAT, uh, but uh, uh, to consumers and users. And in summary, I know I've taken a long time, but this report has so much information, it's so deep, so dynamic. Hopefully it will be most interesting. What are the trends of FDI and some guidelines? The world landscape of FDI in 2021 will continue to be complex because of the 2020 crisis. Although we expect an increase of FDI between 10 to 15%, according to UNCTAD, it is 25% 
bit less than that of 2019. And it is much more optimistic for developed economies and for Asia, less optimistic for Africa and for Latin America. So the pace of world recovery, possible relapses of pandemic, the size of stimulus packages of, of countries, of central countries, like we said at the beginning, US, Europe, China, Asia have made announcements of what they will do in public investments. So transnational corporations seek precisely these incentives, what doubt is there, and looking for greater resilience for their value chains. The major transnational companies have maintained liquidity. They do have liquidity, but more focused in improving suppliers, networks, and strategic acquisitions for the corporate restructuring more than new projects. We have Unilever, for example, we mentioned, and um, uh, General Motors, for example, wants to be in 2035 the company that will be providing only electric vehicles. They want to be the supplier of electric vehicles. The same option is not being seen in Brazil, more focused in Mexico. So you see how the main corporations or large corporations are considering their strategies in terms of what countries have decided and determined if the country want to move to environmental sustainability, renewable energies, electromobility, of course, corporations will respond to these political incentives. So intensity and geographic distribution of investments will depend on recovery plans to be implemented by different countries and China is consolidated as a world economic power. And we see this in detail, how they've used FDI. Let us learn from them how FDI has closed their gaps, uh, technological gaps as investors and consumers. In Latin America and the Caribbean, our projects showed a certain recovery between September 2020 and February 2021. That uh, was optimistic. And we this uh, analysis is, is until May 2021. Once again, there is a drop in the value of these uh, input. We have or oh, uh, important announcement either for this year or for next year in value in amount and number of projects. Yes, there have been important announcements and therefore at this, we are at this level where we are between minus five and plus five, but not totally optimistic, but not totally pessimistic because we are only at mid-year. We do see a very important trend, and that is that the presence of our region in investment projects in renewable energies is almost equivalent, uh, the same as that of Europe. So that means that our region is viewed with enormous potential for renewable energies. And there are two countries that have a clear, I would say, advantage in this, in that area. One is Brazil, where you have an Australian company that is building or has announced the construction of a major green hydrogen project. Green hydrogen is the future of a, a renewable energy, not only in our region, but the whole world. And this project of Brazil will have an investment of $5.4 billion. Same thing with Chile. Chile is also in the process of production of fuels that are hydrogen based, where there is a consortium of important companies, Siemens, Enel, Enap, and there Chile also has had clarity of having a uh, mid-term uh, uh, strategy in renewable energy. So the signals are very important in Latin America and the Caribbean. We see at the Caribbean also, all, everybody is committed to renewable energy, Central America and Costa Rica. So oh, this is a cause, this is a sector, renewable energy that could be more dynamic. Let's make the most of this opportunity. And that is why our forecast, as you can see, 
a stable FDI, lower, yes, lower than in 2019, there's no doubt about it, it will not be a driver of recovery, no, unless in our region there is a greater, dis more decision in terms of policies for recovery. We consider that the variation could be between plus or minus five, uh, plus five on account of the good uh, behavior from January to May, but then after May, it began to drop off. And so we also have the minus five. So we're, so there we are in this gradient between um, plus five and minus five. The possibility of receiving more FDI inflows will depend a lot on the approach given by governments to recovery, because economic recovery will be partial, because although we see the GDP in 2021 did recover of around 5.2%, and in 2022, about 2.9%, it will not be sufficient to recover investment levels and levels of employment. Investment is what has most fallen off in our region, and the trajectory of FDI, therefore, is all, uh, also confirms the close relationship between investment flows and uh, raw material price uh, cycles. And we're concerned in that the rise in the price in raw materials and the major demand in 2021 is encouraging a reprimarization of our economies. And we know that this model will not ensure sustained growth, no more productivity, no better employment, and sharpens differences. That is of concern. What should the region do to address this very deep process of transformation and have uh, explicit strategic plans for recovery and focused on dynamic sectors for a major environmental drive. If we do not do this, FDI will uh, continue going to Europe, North America, and some Asian countries, and this will, uh, will uh, aggravate global asymmetries. And so to close, dear colleagues, I would say that it is urgent to recover a strategic view of the role of uh, foreign direct investment, the sectoral approach in the last decade of FDI does not record real contributions to the, to the diversification of our productive structure. It does not serve to transform the model of a social and uh, and productive model. And there are three areas that we can enhance investments, very powerful investments, renewable energy, as we've seen, and that we are close to Europe, the extension of uh, ability to produce electricity uh, items. We have lithium, we have the main Im imports and for digital transformation. And so let's make the most of at least these three sectors that could help us to really diversify two things, the origins of FDI and sectors towards which we can obtain greater benefits. And lastly, I would merely like to say that what we need is to have a multilateral approach. In the document, we have a very deep analysis of negotiations being carried out in the World Trade Organization, very relevant. These are essential negotiations because they are um, the facilitation of investment for development, not only for the protection of investments. Our region has focused more on protecting the investors regardless of what happens, regardless of whether there is unemployment, if they deteriorate the environment, doesn't matter. Let them bring the capital in. But now the this regulation, multilateral regulation, is far more relevant because it is able to get a greater conversation going between foreign investors and the receiving country or host countries, the communities, local enterprises. And that is what we need in a trade facility to have dialogue, prior dialogue or upfront to avoid later conflicts and also have real benefits by this foreign direct investment of good quality, although it's not the amounts that we saw in the 90s. Maybe not because privatizations do have a ceiling, but yes, it could be investment that will bring technology, employment and productivity. And that, dear colleagues, would be, I regret that I've taken such a long time, but the truth is that the report deserves it. So once again, thank you very much for being here. Unfortunately, we have no audio from the floor.
Efectivamente, además el, el, se sustenta esta presentación en un riquísimo documento. He visto ya varias consultas en el chat uh, uh, que ha acompañado este lanzamiento. We will resume the English interpretation as soon as we recover audio from the floor. We cannot hear the speaker at the moment. Thank you. Directamente allí eh, para eh, acceder a esos materiales que pueden contribuir a su mejor eh, cobertura. Vamos a dar inicio entonces, secretaria ejecutiva, con su venia, al segmento de preguntas y respuestas, agradeciéndole desde ya a las y los colegas que nos han hecho llegar sus inquietudes a través de las vías que les habíamos eh, señalado. La primera de las preguntas, eh, las, primeras, las primeras de las preguntas que vamos a eh, desahogar en este segmento, secretaria ejecutiva, Sería por parte de la colega Valentina Bastías, corresponsal eh, de la agencia de noticias china Xinhua. Y consulta, eh, Valentina, en primer lugar, ¿cómo se han comportado las inversiones chinas en América Latina y el Caribe en el contexto de la pandemia? Y, complementariamente, ¿cómo estos capitales pueden contribuir a la reactivación económica de la región? Consultas de Valentina Bastías, de la agencia de noticias china Xinhua. Orlando Milesi, corresponsal de la agencia Interpress Service de Italia, IPS, plantea las siguientes inquietudes. La sostenida alza que presenta el precio del cobre y el enorme incremento de las energías renovables al descender sus costos de producción podrían contribuir a una recuperación o un incremento de la inversión extranjera directa en Chile. Y complementa su inquietud con la siguiente. ¿Cuánto de la fuerte caída de la inversión extranjera eh, extranjera directa en América Latina y el Caribe es atribuible al coronavirus y o a la forma en que los gobiernos de esta región han enfrentado la pandemia. A futuro, ¿prevé eh, esta relación eh, eh, o los efectos de esta pandemia y el coronavirus en estos flujos y tendencias en la inversión extranjera directa? Consulta de Orlando Milesi, Interpress Service de Italia. Y Cerraríamos este primer bloque de inquietudes con las consultas que nos hace llegar el corresponsal de la agencia Reuters, Fabián Cambero. Fabián eh, le plantea las siguientes inquietudes, secretaria ejecutiva. La primera de ellas, si ante la baja en inversiones en la región y la necesidad de capital post pandemia. In the post pandemic capital, China can seek to increase its influence in the region through direct acquisitions. Second concern is for Fabian Cambero. If mining companies in Chile realize that the royalty project will affect their investment, what is their impact in the development of mining companies in this country? And then lastly, is there room in governments to fill in the lack of income from investments. With these three concerns, Valentia Bastias and Fabian Can Cambero from Reuters, I give the floor to the executive secretary to answer questions. Thank you very much. And we start with Valentina Bancia. Uh, thank you, Bantiwa. Uh, we have answered already. But China is one of the main trade partners of Latin America and the Caribbean and has been uh, very important as an investor since 2010. It has increased presence in the region with different participation modalities, merger and acquisitions, where the biggest investments have been made, development of new projects, construction projects, and of course, these investments have specificities in the region and they try to uh, seek where to have the greatest benefits. I would say that since the first foreign direct investment authorized in Latin America and the Caribbean so far, there have been major progress in, uh, by China. And this is relevant. And there has been progress, especially in the strategic sectors. And I believe that in strategic sectors, beginning, of course, China began with natural resources, mining hydrocarbons, but then has moved towards sectors such as telecommunications, transport, both sea and air, public services, and they've acquired very relevant positions. I would say that for Latin America and the Caribbean, 
mergers and acquisitions by China acquired a tremendous relevance, 8.9%, which is a very relevant share. And I would say that Chinese corporations have uh, had a very interesting uh, behavior in the region. Why could this be positive? Well, first, because Chinese corporations have maintained their interest in continuing to be active in the region, especially in terms of electricity, power, uh, we have two very relevant, important, two state-owned companies, Ch Chinese Jiangxi Power Company and Stateway International Development Limited acquired generation and distribution uh, interests in Chile, for example, and in Peru with a total of five point eight billion dollars. And so, of course, in this case, these uh, inflows are not uh, net inflows because this was really an acquisition. So there is no component in the balance of payments because these are acquisitions of other enterprises, but it does reflect how there is an interest by China to move ahead uh, strongly in this area. Now, how could they contribute? Well, in very many ways, because Chinese corporations that are gaining protagonism worldwide and in the region, the truth is that it is very relevant that we're able to move ahead with this uh, te technological advancement by China in terms of electromobility. I believe that China, without a doubt, they are leaders in the term of manufacturing electric buses, and we in Latin America and the Caribbean could really have a very important role in that area. And recently in Chile, there's just been a, an announcement of the pharmaceutical industry, the establishment of Sinovac here with two very important plants, one for the packaging of the raw material or the active principle of the Sinovac vaccine, and another one in Antofagasta, which would be a plan for a technological innovation. So there we're talking of investment that uh, help us join the bandwagon for Chile to once again be an important producer of vaccines, and not only production for Chile, but for the region. And I believe that that is the right approach to see how to set up companies in the region with a regional approach, a regional market approach. The electric buses could be another major example of how the companies that manufacture buses in China should set up here. And they would have a major market in our cities. In, we are the most urbanized region in the world. And also in terms of the, the digital economy, China is no doubt a power in this area. So we're interested in having each time closer ties in this area. Now, we do believe that we need to do this with bilateral agreements, as they've done with the Belt and Road Initiative, and also Latin America and the Caribbean must make the most of this opportunity and be part of jointly, rather than each one uh, separately, have a more regional approach or sub-regional approach in order to make the most of the opportunities that uh, China is able to offer. In relation to the second question that refers to the rise in the price of copper and an increase in renewable energy, a lower uh, production cost, and how this could support China. Well, recovery of uh, FDI in Chile will depend on several factors. First, of course, it is one of the countries that most recovers in this year, uh, very much co uh, related to consumption not necessarily investment. There's been um, a lot of support for consumption, for demand by households, and this has helped a lot in terms of re economic recovery. Now, the other thing, of course, has been the very good copper prices and the Chinese demand. Of course, this year, China has grown, the United States has grown, raw material demand has gone up and the prices as well, but we don't know is what could happen next year. And of course, that is uh, creating uncertainty. And so basically what does matter here is that uh, how 
Chile has clearly put across their commitment with renewable energy, the substitution of traditional energy moving towards renewables. This is sending out very powerful signals to investors because they know that Chile is going to sustain the rules of the game. Of course, there is a certain uncertainty, yes, but I don't think that this will change in terms of the strategies by these transnational corporations in relation to uh, renewable energy. And all of this will greatly affect the relation with Chile, with China. And the drop in FDI inflow, if this could be attributed or not to the pandemic, well, it is attributed, attrib it can be attributed to the major economic uh, downturn that has happened not only here, but around the world, but not just that. It's not just the pandemic. This is also a change in the strategy of the transnationals. And this is what Latin America and the Caribbean must understand better in terms of the fact that com countries in our region are making major progress in managing the pandemic. Chile is, of course, one of them. And I believe that this also makes it more attractive to the arrival of uh, foreign investors, but not only that, it's not only the pandemic. I think that there is a deep change in corporate strategies in transnational corporations, and that are also taking a look at the signals coming in terms of the medium term recovery plans. If the USA plans to invest a, a trillion dollars in renewables, well, this is a major incentive in order to supplement that, those public investments and the same thing happens in Europe and China. And so our region is lagging a little bit behind in having clarity regarding how we would like to manage this recovery with what dynamic sectors may the, 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 sec the region would like to play. Fabian Candero from Reuters, in view of the drop of investments in the region and China could seek to increase its influence in direct acquisitions and mining in Chile, in Chile consider the royalty uh, bill uh, that is being discussed. Will that impact on that? Is there room to fill in this drop of in investments? We have uh, not see an increase outside of the trend we showed in the report of new acquisitions. Between 2019 and 18, China acquired major uh, uh, purchases in the electric power sector, big, and the share of Chinese corporations has increased in, in main tenders and uh, bids in the strategic sector, electricity, water, infrastructure, transportation. China did not participate there before. And now it's very interested in participating also in 5G digital networks. So we believe that between 2005 and 90, 2019, there is a total of $93 billion of construction projects implemented by Chinese companies in the region. 24 of these projects are in infrastructure and most of them in transportation infrastructure. So there is a signal there of where to strategically is China heading to and indeed, energy, digital, and transportation infrastructure. Those are the three areas. Renewable energies, all that is related to electricity, electromobility, these are the main topics of interest to our region and to China. And yes, there can be greater mer mergers or acquisitions, very likely so. But we are seeing that they have come to set up uh, plants and factories and uh, major plants like this of Sinovac for not only by companies that already existed, but bring in Chinese companies to settle and set up their uh, plans. As to the royalty, the collection of the mining 
income is clear. It's the only way to transform natural ca non-renewable capital into a more lasting capital uh, and equity. Uh, and this is a lesson to be learned. So Chile and Peru have had and developed fiscal tax instruments that are very reasonable to tax um, mining earnings, the tax on the corporate tax, specifically on the operational margin, these are very important instruments. However, we believe that today, because of the effective rate, currently these rates are higher in Peru, 58% versus 46% in Chile. So there is room because we are speaking about the same resource. The resource does not walk and, and leaves, no. Uh, uh, the same companies. So if Peru has increased the effective rate to 58% and Chile is only 46, there is uh, space there, there is room at least to assess and evaluate the royalty and see if there can be an effective higher tax and how to bring together the effective taxes on earnings and nominal rates and modify royalty in order to be, make it more progressive. And this is important. That is why we believe that a reform of this kind could maybe impact on the competitiveness of projects, but all depends on what types of projects and mining. But truly, I think, this bill needs to be assessed in different scenarios, and it is important that royalty be serving other productive sectors so as to transform this non-renewable equity into a lasting equity. Chile has room, so let's make the most of it. Is there room in governments in order to compensate for the la la loss of income? We have maintained that the region should maintain expansive fiscal or tax policies and must be in investment. The investment in the region is 17.6% in 2020. It's the lowest one in the world. It's the lowest one as compared to other regions and the lowest one of the last three decades. With this, we cannot make any progress. 17% investment, I mean, what can we make of that? And we are nine points distance from the world average. Nine, the developed uh, oh, economies have 37 uh, percent so we have very low levels of investments and that is key and that is something that we need to address uh, public investment private foreign investment to be focused in dynamic dynamizing sectors cepal has proposed eight new renewable energy a circular economy a electromobility manufacturing health industry vaccine digitization, of course, 66 million homes not connected to the web, to internet. We are a hyper-connected society, but only at elite level. We don't reach out to the whole population. So there is room to there for investment and others like water, uh, sanitation, electric power, welcome investment there in order to improve the well-being of people. You have people without uh, drinkable water nor electric power. We have calculated how much that investment can be. And it's not more than 1.3% of GDP in both cases. So we are before the actual possibility for our region to forecast uh, uh, the recovery plans based on uh, drive a major impulse articulating investments in um, and based on environmental sustainability, creating jobs, decreasing environmental footprint. That is all. That is, that would be uh, this uh, the answers to these uh, three questions, Guido. Thank you very much, Executive Secretary. And we thank all the colleagues that are attending our press conference. 
And this, and the first one is Patricia Nieto from EFE uh, Agency of Spain asking why the drop uh, when it was so significant since December when there is 40, 45, 55 points and the present calculation is 34.7. Was it because of immunization or because of the pandemic? Why so much difference between December and the one that has uh, reported today? Second question, the pandemic has undermined all socioeconomic indices, but the investment of China in Chile to settle, to establish a Sinovac plant for the production and, and distribution, so the pandemic would generate new investment opportunities in a context of crisis. She's Patricia Nieto from the Spanish EFE agency. Ángeles Aguilar from La Razón, from Mexico, asks how much I have FDI went back in 2020 in Mexico, and what's the estimate for 2021? And what are the main obstacles for investment in Mexico? And as a last question, is, or two questions from Andres Huerta from ADN Radio of Chile. And he asks, recently, the free uh, antitrust uh, regulator regulator or or is investigating CGE and Sinovac is going to establish a, a vaccine company. How do you evaluate the investments of China in Chile? And Chilean deputies have warned about political risks and antitrust risks because of uh, uh, Chinese corporations in Chile. Those were the questions of Andres Huerta, Ángeles Aguilar, and Patricia Nieto. I give back the floor to you. Thank you. Well, Patricia Nieto is asking an important question about what were the factors of this backwardness of FDI of 55 to 45 in our region, and what has been the impact of the pandemic? The growth of uh, country economies is one of the main factors affecting FDI. If there are good prospects, not good uh, about growth of a country, and we need to understand that this region declined to minus 6.8%. Does it have perspectives to grow in 2021 of 5.2%? And that we need to take into account the drop of last year was even less than expected because in the third uh, uh, quarter, there was a better behavior. And also we need to say, because governments have made enormous efforts because they've invested very importantly uh, in order to sustain the demand of whole households with cash transfers, basic emergency incomes, and in all countries. So we need to consider all those factors. Yes, in fact, there has been an impact of the pandemic in general and throughout the world. And of course, those signals make transnational corporations to come to a stall and think, uh, where do they want to address or focus their investments. Some are medium and long term. This is worldwide the drop, and also, but our region is one of the most affected ones. But because we haven't sent the appropriate signals in terms of, yes, I mean, emergency, but this has to be connected with recovery because if not, what possibilities are we offering investment in general, not only FDI, but also private investment? Public investment also has to give a major drive and impulse. Uh, so 
the 17.6 percent public and private investment in the region so we need to give signals that our countries also want to invest in our region uh, uh, we need to trust our own region so that is first and uh, also i think and also i believe that the second semester 2020 was less negative than expected and positive in the case of Mexico. That is why let's talk a little bit about Mexico in the next question. Mexico and Brazil explain almost 72% of FDI in the region. Without a doubt, their performance, well, Brazil fell very uh, soundly, but Mexico did not. And so, in fact, the fall in FDI was a slightly less than would have been expected, but nevertheless, irrelevant. The 34.7% is a major drop from 105 billion. Uh, 56 billion did not arrive, as it was the case in 2019. And so the pandemic has been devastating. Yes, of course, it's been devastating. And it has been devastating on account of thousands of reasons. First of all, because the region has not had equitable access to vaccines, that is, there is a major asymmetry in, in comparison to the rest of the world. The developed world has uh, hogged vaccines and as they're even talking about the third doses and there are other countries in the region that has barely uh, have any of the first uh, dose or uh, many countries are under 15 percent of their population vaccinated and even in some cases in central america less than three percent of the population so asymmetries are very big in comparison to the rest of the world as well as within the region in terms of access to vaccines and i believe that this is important it should be said because this is a disincentive uh, for not only investments, but also Caribbeans for tourism, uh, Caribbean, Central America. And so economic activity drops off in general. Now, uh, now, of course, there are some countries that are over 60%, such as in the, uh, Chile and Uruguay, and so they're opening up a bit more. But it's not the case of the entire region. And also, I believe that our region must be more clearly, more clear, explicit about their recovery plans and in what strategic uh, sectors they're going to place their marbles. Uh, so, uh, we're going, we, do we, we finally have an industrial policy in the region, yes or not? Because if not, once again, we're uh, left uh, at a uh, at, uh, at, uh, just uh, free and moving about from one way to another. And what we need to say, one activity. Uh, ECLAC is preparing its uh, self-sufficiency report to strengthen the capacities of the region in terms of uh, vaccines uh, at the request of CELAC. And we detected that the region, yes, does have the capacities and had them when, for example, Chile had a capacity to produce vaccines discouraged 18 years ago, but it means that the, these technical capacity for technology and research did exist and can be recovered. And we are seeing that there are countries that do have these capacities. And that is why setting up the setup of Sinovac is, a, we, we believe, is a great piece of news and that will it also come to Chile and also Brazil and Mexico, and but has decided to come to Chile with two very specific plans, one in the metropolitan region for the packaging and distribution of the Sinovac vaccine and another plant in the north, Antofagasta, for research. I would like to say that our region has a tremendous capacity in terms of uh, clinical trials. This has also been proven here in Chile at the Catholic University within the consortium of universities of, uh, that used to be of the state and their uh, capacities for clinical trials, phase two, phase three. If there are no clinical trials, there are no vaccines. We must be clear about that. So if we have a potential to do clinical trials, it means that we also have a potential to negotiate better with the pharmaceuticals that have come to do their clinical trials in our region, either to get more vaccines or for them to come and set up in the region. Uh, AstraZeneca, Mexico, Argentina, now Sinovac. I think that there are major opportunities here and we must make the most of this. 
The other question by Angeles Aguilar, how much did FDI uh, fall back in Mexico during 2020? What, are, uh, what is our estimate for 2021 and what are the main obstacles? Now, in 2020, Mexico continued to be the second greatest uh, host of FDI in the region. And this has come, has come each time closer to Brazil in this last year. FDI inflows represented $31.365 billion, and it grew 6.6% .6 in comparison to 2019. So it did not fall. No, it grew. I would like to highlight that we, of course, used the balance of payments manual six of the IMF and say that what FDI is, if we went to use five, then the balance or the study could have been different. And so this is very much related to how accounting uh, of investment is done. But I would like to say that according to the IMF uh, manual six, uh, uh, inflows increased by 6.6% represented 30% of the regional total. That is, Mexico represented 19% in 2019 of the regional total, and today it is 30% in 2020. So I believe that Mexico has been able to attract a very significant amount of FDI and continues to be the greater host in Central America. And the truth is that in this cycle for the entire region, and we consider that it will even be more favorable in 2021. And this has a lot to do with the recovery of the US economy, which is the main destination of uh, Mexican exports and the ratification of the free trade agreement between the USA, Mexico, and Canada. And the truth is that there, yes, this is news that gives certainty to enterprises. And so I believe that it is important to confirm this. I believe that that factor the treaty is essential, and of course, the behavior in each sector varies, but there is no doubt that there are, there's very interesting news, and that I think is well worthwhile highlighting this in terms of investors, USA number one towards Mexico, Canada second place, and Spain and Japan uh, that also have great interest in having projects in Mexico. So we believe that this is very relevant, especially there are more announcements, more prospects, and especially in the automotive sector and uh, motor parts. In the sector of the infrastructure, there is no doubt that Mexico is taking on major infrastructure projects and foreign investors are interested. The transseismic corridor, among others, the pharmaceutical sector, without a doubt, that also is very, very important. And the other major topic is pension funds that have moved towards Mexico from Canada. And there have been very interesting transactions in Mexico. But I believe that these uh, infrastructure projects, highways, for example, have uh, created much interest and the pharmaceutical sector, there is no doubt that there's also been a lot of interest, for example, by Canada in acquiring a laboratory, a Mexican laboratory company, the Invecra Group. Well, in the uh, actual report, you can find very concrete examples. There is a section on Mexico and where I believe that you can find all of this information. Now, which are the main obstacles? Well, I would say that more than obstacles, they are uh, for this to improve because it's not doing that badly. Strengthen local capacities in technological terms, uh, human resources. Mexico has made great headway, in fact, in terms of human capacities, but more towards the north of the country, far less towards the south. And there, it is very relevant, yes, to definitely that uh, the foreign companies that come to set up in Mexico should strengthen productive chains, mainly with uh, local SMEs. 
And of course, manufacturing, for example, in the transport sectors continues to be very competitive. We also believe that in financial services, there's a lot of interest in the pharmaceutical sector. So we believe that what's most important for Mexico is to focus on the training of human resources in moving ahead more in technological capacities and skills. They are there. I would say a better articulation between technological sectors, R&D, and productive sectors. And I think that that could help greatly. The question by Andres Huerta by, uh, from Radio ADN. The Chilean free competition regulator approved the state grid uh, company and the Chinese one and the Sinovac. And how do you assess this increase in Chile? And will this increase competitiveness in the local market and the country growth? And the deputies have warned of the geopolitical uh, risks and uh, 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 free competition. Well, we shall see. But Chinese investments in Chile, yes, have focused in the acquisitions and mergers in the electricity sector, as has already been said. But they were already of foreign companies. It's not that they were Chilean. They were owned by foreign companies. China bought from the uh, US. And there is a fairly well uh, regulated market. Uh, it's not that it's unregulated, but the important thing is that these Chinese uh, companies will follow the rules and that is important. Uh, announcements of projects by China we can highlight in renewable energies, uh, telecommunications, the new data center for Huawei in Chile. I believe that this is very relevant for Chile because it will allow it to have a digital infrastructure and so digitalize its own Chilean companies. So we do not ha yet have the capacity in the region to do what Huawei is doing. But so if Huawei comes, this will allow us to enhance the digitalization of local enterprises. And that could be very positive for Chile. And that is the sort of thing you need to measure. What is the foreign company contribute to the country and how this uh, ties in with the uh, productive structure in the rest of the country. Same as Sinovac. Sinovac, we said this yesterday here in Chile, this was a very positive because it affects all sectors, national heritage, uh, putting up the, the, the land, the consortium of universities in, you know, in, you know, in Tofagasta, there with a Catholic university, another series of research centers. And so these consortiums, I would say, what you need to create are consortiums and these consortiums must articulate foreign direct investment, technology, research and local enterprises and of course public enterprises and private enterprises both and so we need to make the most of this and that is what we think is possible chile has examples such as for example the uh, astronomy observatory this is a consortium of 15 european countries chile has benefited greatly from this why because they have the ideal setting for astronomical observation in the Southern Hemisphere, because also this has truly enhanced Chilean development in this area, in the area of astronomy. And so the same sort of thing could happen in the area of the pharmaceuticals. And if Sinovac and if Chile, as has been said, can enhance the production, not only for Chile, but for the entire region, well, they, this will become a very a sub-regional or regional platform of great relevance. And then in relation to the risks, uh, of course, I believe it is important to say that it is true. Yes, Europe and the USA have strengthened their uh, regimes for in, in the control of investments, basically from China, because what they were, were very concerned about is that Chinese companies were acquiring European and US uh, corporations to benefit from patents, technologies, installed capacities. And so, yes, that yes, it, it, we must be clear. In many cases, the, these are co companies are under state control. 81% of those who come are state owned. And so, yes, there are very important uh, asymmetries and that must be kept very clear. And take a look at what Europe and the US is doing and see 
And of course, yes, and that is why the multilateral mechanisms for uh, for uh, foreign investment are so relevant. Those mechanisms facilitating investment, placing at the same field, at the same level, the investor country, the host country, with those participating in the investment, foreign investment project, makes all the difference. It's not only protecting the interests of the investors, but of course, there is a risk. But if we expand that to a multilateral framework, which is what WTO is trying, that is the path to be followed in Latin America and the Caribbean. And with this, Guido, we conclude, I think, this second session. Yes, Executive Secretary, I thank you for your answers to the requests of our colleagues. Uh, of course, now abusing of your time, we will go on to this last concerns. Yes, uh, time is up, but we will approach this uh, third block of questions. I know that uh, these uh, don't be don't be worried because we will send answers to your concerns, to your questions. And we, we, we will have a third final block. Vicente Salazar, a journalist from La Repubblica of Peru, beginning of July and before the change of government, it was estimated that Peruvian government would lead the environmental growth of the South. Do you? We still maintain the 9.5% for 2021? That is the question of colleague Salazar from Peru. Carlos Rodriguez from Bloomberg. The political uncertainty and social unrest in some countries of the region is affecting or can it affect FDI this year? That's a question of Carlos. Rodríguez Salcedo from Bloomberg, and then Badia Espinosa from Convergenza from Ecuador. What are the analytical frameworks, best practices, recommendations that can expect or provide new approaches to investment incentives? Uh, uh, what are the new agricultural investments how can you guarantee a transparent and continuous dialogue between private, social, public, and civil in order to move towards uh, more sustainable food systems? That is, Mayor Convergenza. Those are the three final questions. And with that, we would conclude this third and last session of Q&A. Thank you. The very important, the question on Peru. Yes, we confirm that our growth estimate for Peru is 9.5% for 2021 and 4.4% for 2022. The external context provides very good perspectives for Peru. Uh, one of the main ones is uh, growth of trade partners, especially with the US, copper in general, mining prices favor Peru, and the terms of trade also are growing to its maximum level of the last 11 years. So insofar as external environment for Peru, excellent perspectives that is expressed by numbers and models. At the same time, internally, you can see an important recovery of domestic demand, especially in the area of construction and uh, household consumption. That is how we view Peru in the first uh, months of the year. There's greater political certainty. There is a new government in place. And I think that Peru has good prospects for 2021 and 2022. Of course, all the region in 2022 will grow less 
that needs to be clear. What we need to drive that growth be sustained, sustainable in dynamic sectors. It's important to move towards more dynamic sectors of the economy beyond the good prospects of mining. Carlos Rodriguez from Bloomberg, the political uncertainty and instability of some countries, can it affect FDI? Well, what is FDI seeking? That's the first question. What's the purpose? Very often, they come to have natural resources. We are a rich region on natural resources. Secondly, they seek markets. That is why Mexico and Brazil are the main leaders, because they have an important domestic market. Also, Brazil is sub-regional market and Mexico uh, related to the North American. Of course, markets. And also, they seek greater efficiency less costs, less production costs, or lower. And so political variables affect instability or uncertainty, political and social uncertainty do have an impact. Very often we are speaking about medium term reaction. So to have certainty about politics and rules, it's important, but that doesn't mean that countries need to be uh, stuck in previous uh, rules. I mean, Chile is changing political pact that they, they are discussing a constitution. And also there are countries that have revisited their royalties. Peru has higher ones than Chile. So here they're reviewing mining royalty rates and effective rates and so forth. So of course, Uncertainty does have an impact, indeed, instability as well. The other part that has also affected is what is happening today in connection with the pandemic. That is one of the main topics that is really impacting the whole region and the access to vaccines. Uh, we uh, the world is hyper-globalized, and now we are in a process of a very complex transition. There are many opportunities in our region in these three areas. Where, where do you find a market? Where do you have efficiencies? I would say exploration of new players, and it is there that we invite our region to rethink strategies so as to create new dynamic sectors like renewable energy, digital services, health manufacturing industries or health industries, tremendous potential. Yes, we in CEPAL don't get involved in political stability issues. Yes, in those of uh, social instability, yes, because that is the focus of that is inequality the culture of privileges, inequality, concentration of wealth, of income in only a few hands. And the only way to fight social or combat social instability is with greater distribution. And the way of distributing is when you have a better relationship between capital and labor, where you have a better relationship between employment, productivity, and environmental sustainability, which that is the uh, spade uh, that is uh, democracy spade that is affecting us all. And uh, I would add to your question, political instability, economic, no, 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 Carlos Rodriguez, political, economic, environmental instability or uncertainty, the drought that we are facing, for example, in South America, very strongly. Floods in other parts of the world, climate change, that is it. So all these factors need to be in sync so as to analyze investments, all of them, and FTI in particular. FTI involves who want to come to our region. And what we can see is that transnational 
European and US corporations are preferring to stay in their own regions, their own countries where they feel safer, more resilient, and where they can guarantee their supply chain. So they think it twice to see what that is their strategy, what is ours? That is the question. Juan Espinosa. What are the analytical frameworks, best practices, recommendations that can inspire new opportunities in agricultural investments? And what is the commitment of governments and investors? How to guarantee transparent dialogue, public, private, and civil society? Very good questions. Thank you very much, because in fact, this is what motivates us to rethink foreign investment on the one hand, but at the same time, uh, development in general. We think we urge countries to a change of model because the model that we've had in the last decades is a one that is extractivist, concentrator, and not sustainable uh, environmentally and socially speaking, and creates inequality. And uh, so therefore we need to reorient investments, plans, and strategies, outlooks to more dynamic sectors that may generate new perspectives in energy, of course, covering the main primary needs of sanitation, water. Uh, how can we have, and electricity, how can we have people, towns without access to drinkable water or electricity? Priorities, of course. And these dynamic sectors can give us an opportunity to move to a, a higher technological development stage, generating employment and reducing the footprint. We have spoken about three gaps, social gap, balance of payments gap, our dependence on the external sector. In the pandemic, it was shown that practically everything was imported in this, vaccines, medication, equipment, respirators, ventilators. So we were struck um, and in a tremendous vulnerability. This region does have capacity to produce ventilators, alcohol, gel, uh, masks, face masks, all the companies like so reshaped in order to provide these goods. So we have also the possibility to have a renewable energy feasible, environment and agriculture, something feasible. Our region is facing food insecurity as never before, food insecurity. We have gone back 15 years according to FAO reports and of the World Food Forum. So we need to channel greater, higher investments to the agriculture, forestry, sectors with a new outlook that is not of monocultures or intensive uh, uh, crops or mono crops. No, with something integral, integrating, with comprehensive with forest management, something clear, a clear view of the integrity of new system, of ecosystems because we are having water deficit, soil and, and biodiversity, biodiversity, which is the source of agriculture. And our region that was the venue or, or rather the uh, many goods grew here, tomato, potatoes, uh, 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 beans, they originated here in our region with our native peoples. It is there that these major crops developed and corn as well. So be careful. If we don't know how to integrate 
biodiversity and we don't move to an agrodiversity, agroforestry with the best technology, yes. And something else, water, how do we capture water? How can we recycle water? How can we manage in a world that it's going to be ever more difficult from the perspective of sustainability? And we have identified these sectors and we be see, believe that conditions, key conditions is that countries develop policies, industrial policies of productive transformation. Industrial With policies. environmental sustainability and social equality. That is what we think. And we believe that the strategies for training must also be done with local productive structures on processes and that must create jobs. And so we believe that is essential. And I would like to uh, tell you of some food chains that have been very dynamic in the region. In the case of Argentina, Brazil, soybean, in the case of Mexico, a uh, uh, very important fruit uh, exporter, uh, Colombia, cocoa, coffee, and the avocados, uh, paltas as they are called here. And uh, there are major opportunities for far more profitable and sustainable work. What is the sort of commitment? Well, it requires of new political compacts renewed linked to fiscal compacts and where there is uh, we or oh, that leads to the creation of this uh, uh, agreement and dialogue between investors countries or the investment host countries enterprises producing the goods to have value chains so we have said this many times but i believe that this is the opportunity to do it the pandemic has taught us a very a serious lesson. If we do not move towards a society, a care society that cares for the planet, that cares for its workers, that cares for its peasants, that uh, cares for its women, and not the, that it's the women that care for others, we need to move ahead in that direction. And so definitely agriculture is a key factor. The region has a great opportunity, but at the same time, a major challenge that is overcoming the malnutrition and uh, the uh, issue with the nutrition that affects seriously affects the region. And this is the only way of moving towards a future of greater well-being for our people. Thank you. Executive Secretary, as we have already said, this is the last block of the concerns that uh, we have been able to answer since we're already well behind time. But uh, yeah, uh, Roberta Gonzalez from uh, La, La Prensa, Panama, and Laura Quinteros from Mexico, Jose Aura from Expansión, Mexico, and that in the very short term, we will be sending you in writing the answers to the questions that you have asked, among others as well, uh, over the chat. The where, ECLAC website, you can find also the report uh, at your uh, service. You can download it and uh, study it in greater depth. And also the pres presentation by the Executive Secretary, collaboration for efforts to communicate this and there too, you will find a link to the uh, to the photos to be able to illustrate whatever articles you write on this launch um, at your service. And of course, our constant gratitude at by ECLAC and the Public Information Unit for the great effort made by all of you, colleagues, journalists to uh, serve as a bridge to, to reach with our content, our messages and proposals made by ECLAC to the audiences that you uh, service every day through your media. And so Executive Secretary, if you would like to uh, close the uh, uh, event or the final thought, well, thank you very much, everyone who has been with us here already by this time of the afternoon in least in Chile. I'd like to thank you for your interest and say the message is clear. And that is our region 
must move quickly towards having strategic plans for recovery with industrial policies, productive policies, and sustainable development, both environmentally and directed towards the creation of jobs, greater social equality. There is no other way. There is no other way than this one. And so we must think deeply. Foreign direct investment is very important, but for it to be a true driver of development, we must make sure it is. And to do that, we must be clear as to where we want to go as a region. That would be my message. And what I would like is merely to once again thank the team that has contributed to this major report under the coordination of Alvaro Calderón, Cecilia Plotier, Marco Vidin, Valeria Jordan, Georginia Núñez, Matilda Closet, Fernando Rojas, and Denunza Saporito, Leandro Cabello, and Filipa da Silva. I believe that here we have a team, a very sound team from the Division of Productive and Business Development. Of course, so many more are taking part, editorial, the Division of Information Technology uh, that is with us here, the press department, and so many of people who are here with me this afternoon. And so from everyone, part of this institution, ECLAC, and we hope that this may be useful to everyone. Thank you very much. And let's recall that all of this was done under the con coordination by Giovanni Estupo. Thank you. Thank you. And Bianca Galiada, I forgot. Bianca, of course, yes, Bianca. Well, thank you very much, Executive Secretary. And so we say farewell to everyone who's been with us here, the channels that we've opened through the Zoom, as well as uh, the social media through the ECLAC website. And our unit is, of course, at your service, journalist colleagues, to answer your concerns about these and other topics that are uh, every day put across by ECLAC. And so the invitation is to follow us through social media and to see which will be the next steps and chapters in this constant adventure by ECLAC to provide content, argument, messages, proposals for sustainable and egalitarian development for our region. Executive Secretary Alicia Varsena, we thank you, of course, for your, uh, your disposition and have set aside this very long time for this message. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Hasta luego. Thank you very much. So long. Recording stopped.